Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Podcana episode 45. We're here off the back of two different card game weekends. I came back from the Pro Tour. I believe Moyen was playing One Piece. Um, Moyen, we were just talking about before you hopped on, maybe have slipped a bit out of the rank one slot in the hardcore ELO, um, which is no problem. It's such, it, it is such a grind, to be honest. And like you mentioned, it's funny. It's a funny situation because there's no decay on that leaderboard, so you can just kind of sit it uh, for a while. But we've got a lot of Lorcana to look forward to. We had a bunch of news. Um, we had the initial sales for the Lorcana challenges come out. Which we'll get into. <laughs> it was uh, it was interesting to say the least. But other than that, I just want to get y'all's recaps uh, for your past week. More, you talk a little bit about One Piece if you want. I know, Kawa, you played a tournament as well. So, whoever wants to go first. Um, yeah. So I I lost a bit on on the uh, Pixel Born leaderboard. If I hadn't played, because I was I was tied at rank one with someone, and I wanted it all for, all for myself. If I hadn't played, I would be rank one right now because. Uh, the rank one right now is lower than that, but then I went on a little bit of a losing streak when uh, switch decks and always hit some bad matchups. And usually I would just play more and get it back, but uh, now I need to devote, or since then I've needed to devote a lot of time to preparing for a One Piece regionals in UK. That's that's happening this weekend. Yeah, uh, I spent last weekend participating in the first major Star Wars Unlimited. Uh, tournament, which was actually really, really fun. I was also in the UK. Uh, we'll probably touch on uh, Star Wars Limited again later in this podcast because I know some people were <laughs> already asking Moyen in the comments for like deck lists and stuff like that. But uh, it was cool. I have to say, for a game that only came out like two weeks ago, uh, everyone seems like super, super invested in it. So that was fun. I also tried out like kind of a weird new format for Lorcana this weekend, which was like 3v3. Um, I wasn't really a fan of it it was more or less kind of this format we were just testing but i do like the idea sort of where if there's kind of three players playing at certain stages maybe you could like reach out to a player and ask for advice in a certain play but how we did it was basically like you could kind of communicate the whole time and i i did not like that because i wanted to just play my game was it uh, you guys each had to play different colors or what was the yeah yeah it was like all six inks spread across so the strategy could literally be like oh just do like four good inks and maybe one bad one uh, but the whole format and points and stuff was like kind of all over the place. But the idea is interesting. I think it's, as far as I'm aware, people are trying to pitch it to Ravensburger as like a side event, a casual kind of side event for some of these major, major events, which is kind of interesting. But there's things I liked, things I didn't like. But besides that, weekend was was good. I played Amber Steel, which is something else we're going to talk about a little bit because uh, I was talking about it with Moyen. And I do like the core of the deck, what it's trying to accomplish, but it does seem... Like it really rests on getting your whole wheel combo, which if you can get off early, the deck just pops off like crazy. But against a lot of decks in the meta right now, specifically, I actually just faced Sapphire Steel. I found like it was pretty difficult because Cogsworth just shuts down all of your damage cards with resist. And then Rise of the Titans, great location killer, but also great item killer, right? And if your whole game plan is flutes, it kind of kind of sucks. Yeah. Yep. I just wanted to mention that if you're looking for the Sakazuki spreadsheet or the Star Wars Unlimited secret <laughs> deck slash tier list, it'll be on our Patreon at our $150 tier. So check that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, if I can say something about it, Go no, I, appreci I, I appreciate some, some nice DMs, but pl please stop DMing me for Sakazuki spreadsheets and, <laughs> and Star Wars deck lists. I, I have, so for, for Sakazuki, I guess um, that is. I'm working on it myself, and I'm not just giving that out for free to anyone. And for for Star Wars, I've played it like one day, so yeah, you, you're probably you're better honestly off you're better not, off messaging me. And even I don't yeah. want the messages, but I played more, <laughs> way more Star Wars than Moyen, so yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable giving advice on something I know so little about. All right. Into the news, we had tickets go on sale for Atlanta and Lille for the Locana challenges. Um, Yep. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that happened. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there was uh, like 500 slots for each, maybe. They sold out in less than 60 seconds. If you listened to our advice on our podcast last week, you would have been well prepared for that. That being said, you probably still didn't get a ticket um, because it was buggy. The sites were crashing. And I personally, I didn't even know that they were going on sale. My phone had been broken and lead up to the Pro Tour. And I actually just got a new phone. So I wasn't on Twitter or anything. 
And yeah, they went up for sale when I was at the Pro Tour. So I didn't get a ticket. I'll be looking to get one. Um, if anybody listening to this is at PPG or you know somebody at PPG that can help us uh, get a ticket or something like that, if they want content creators represented, let us know. That'd be great because, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's looking rough at this point. Uh, I definitely reached out to some friends and there's there seems to be no way. They did say they're going to be increasing the cap, so maybe that's a good thing. Um, I'm not sure... <laughs> I read the, I looked at the wording when they talked about increasing caps. <clears throat> it read like that was not their initial plan. It read like their initial plan was to sell 512 tickets. Um, and now they would be exploring <laughs> opening up slots, which is not good. <clears throat> but um, my hope is that they had a larger, there is actually larger capacity and it's like a reasonable thing to explore is opening up tickets and, and providing more slots. Um, I think this demand should have absolutely been expected, <clears throat> especially with precedent in the industry, looking at One Piece, other big, other big IPs. And um, I think they're incentivized to make these as big as possible, right? Like they're, they're not cheap. The tournament organizers probably making money. They want as many people there. It's good for the game. So open them up. Let me in. Let me <laughs> in. Um, but yeah, the respective tournament organizers for the Lakana challenges are pro play games in North America and it is tournament center in the EU um, both of which are renowned uh, tournament organizers PPG is famous for Yu-Gi-Oh and One Piece from what I understand I've not been able to interact with them um, in my career at all via whether it's magic or flesh and blood or anything like that so this will be my first time attending a PPG event tournament center I have interacted with um which honestly, like I know I was like, oh, it didn't go so well. So it didn't go so well on like the back end, right? Like uh, uh, in regards to the tournament, it was actually okay. This was a flesh and blood, the world championships in Barcelona. The tournament ran okay. Like it wasn't bad. Like there are some, definitely some train wreck stories. Um, and tournament center was not the train wreck story. On the back end, there was some like equipment that didn't get through and like pretty much all of the panels they planned to host didn't get, didn't end up get ho getting hosted. And also they had some logistical challenges with like thousand plus player side events because there was some specific promo and gamers love promos. So um, it was a bit hectic, but overall I think that they're like a high tier tournament organizer so that is good so let's go around the panel i didn't get a ticket moyen i got a ticket yeah, moyen i got was a very ticket. close uh the, the purchase didn't go through at first and i reloaded and i had my ticket and i was over the moon yeah i i i did not i did not get a ticket unfortunately <laughs> my my fiance was trying for a ticket she got a ticket so i'm glad you know we, we can have her be be represent me for the pod Canada team it can be uh, Kawa's fiance and Moyen rocking it in the finals yeah. of uh, in, in in Lille. But uh, uh, I can't speak about too much at the moment. But I am trying to go for a casting position for a lot of the EU events. Obviously, I'd I'd love to play as well. But if I can get in anyway, I'll I'll, I'll get in right. So um, that's my plan at the moment. Hopefully that that works out that way. I can still attend the, the EU events. And of course, the first weekend. Uh, Atlanta and uh, Lille, they're going to be on the same weekend, but who knows, maybe uh, for some of the NA events, me and Moyne could make it over, maybe have it with Brendan, vice versa, but uh, I mean, definitely for the for the European Championships and the NA Championships, like we'll we'll mm -hmm. we'll be there for sure. I know for a fact I'm making those. Yeah, so. I wouldn't necessarily recommend flying for these tournaments. To be honest, I would say save it for the higher tier tournaments that are coming later this year. Also, I. Uh, I did a lot of <clears throat> rounds walking around at the Pro Tour in Flesh and Blood, and there's a lot of big tournament organizers, like mid-tier tournament organizers. In in addition to SEG, Channel Fireball, there's other organizers that I know, um, and other big players in the TCG space. Uh, there's some exciting things coming to Lorcana in 2024. That's pretty much all I can say, but there's definitely going to be some reasons to travel. And um, whatever <clears throat> you have in mind, I can tell you it's bigger. Uh, right now, I was very, very surprised. So that is exciting. Um, yeah, I guess to close out that, I would say just final PSA, or not PSA, but just a cry for help. If you can help us get tickets, please <laughs> hit us up. We would love, <laughs> we would love a way to get into these events, represent Pod Canada, represent the community. Um, and we are all competitors at heart. We want to compete at these tournaments. We want to be there on the floor 
grinding with all of you. So um, yeah, hopefully we can find a way in. Uh, last thing I want to say is just <laughs> tips to get your ticket in the future. And this is coming from someone who didn't. Uh, you should be on Twitter. You should be on Twitter. You should be following Pro Play Games Tournament Center. You should turn on notifications. You should be ready to go. You should have your Melee account details um, ready to go. You should be ready to log in. Um, and that is the best you can do. You should probably have multiple devices loaded up, probably on your phone and your desktop in case one crashes. Just like go for it 2x um other than that that's long, pretty much long connection if you can oh, like yeah, you know sure. fastest fastest stuff like that uh, another one that isn't going to help too much but it is also important as well as twitter and stuff uh, i know for a fact that tournament center has a discord and they actually have some very helpful staff so there were some issues where people basically had purchases confirmed but then they had to contact customer service to like to actually confirm them because the site was crashing and stuff like that so all i'll say is like be in these discords but also I mean, it's it's easier said than done, but don't annoy staff. Like, don't don't literally DM one this one per, poor staff member from tournament center saying, "Please, I didn't get my ticket. Help me," you know. But it's important to be in these places because that's where you can get the um, most up to date information. Yep. I overall, it's uh, I know it's it's probably doesn't feel like this for a lot of people, but it is good news. There's a lot of demand for the game. There's a lot of de demand for the game competitively, and that is a good thing. Um, I would really like to see Lorcana kind of kick off with like thousand plus player events. That would definitely be electric. All right, in other order of business, Podcan hit 2K subs. That's pretty big. Um, thank Woo. you all who did subscribe. It's kind of crazy the amount of growth that we've seen in the past like month or two, especially on the back end. <laughs> Funny stories like we we did we did do a little call out in Podcan at one point. We're like, hey guys, we did get review bombed. If you could review us, that'd be great. And uh, yeah, y'all definitely showed up, <laughs> and that helped a lot. I'll tell you, you boosted our back end, uh, back end listens and downloads by like three x because we started ranking high in SEO. Um, so thank you to everybody who did that, and it's kind of converted on YouTube as well. So we're really appreciative for all the support so far, and um, yeah, we hope we can keep providing good content for all of you. Um, next thing is the Stitch events. What's the name of them again? Is it like regional? Oh, I keep calling them store showdowns. Store I know showdown. that's not the name. No, that's not the name. I'm pretty. I'm pretty <laughs> sure the official name is Set Championships. Okay, pretty mm -hmm. sure. We'll call them Stitch yeah. events. Um, <laughs> yeah, so those are probably also going to be hard to get into. I can't confirm yet, but my plan of action this next week is me and a friend are splitting the list of the, um, the local game stores in Dallas, Texas, and we're calling all of them to try to get spots. My goal is to play like five. Um, I think you should absolutely be doing that at the very minimum if you want to get in. You should be calling ahead. You should be trying to reserve a slot, and you should probably have some sort of spreadsheet to try to map out which ones you want to go to. Uh, I think if you show up on the day, I would, wouldn't be surprised if all of them are sold out. It's going to be yeah. A, yeah I know. Good. I know for a fact at this stage from the LGS that I've talked at least over here that if any of them uh, will be running these events, that's all confirmed like this week. They would have got the confir confirmation emails. They're all ready and set to go. So there's already some places here that are like selling tickets. Um, and it all also just depends on where you are, right? Maybe there are literally only like two LGSs relatively close to you. So just make sure you can try to get to as many as you can because uh, it's going to be tough. Another thing I do want to mention about these events, I was talking to Brennan about this earlier, is uh, it's pretty much over like just two weeks. And when it's over two weeks, that pretty much means just two weekends because a lot of people can't play during the week. So many of these stores, if there are a lot in your area, may host on the same day, which sucks a little bit if you're a very competitive player and you want to play in as many of these events as possible. But you can go, oh, I could do this one on a Friday, on a Saturday, on a Sunday, and like five stores just do it on one Saturday. You have to just pick one. It does suck, but Brennan was telling me this is this is quite common. Unfortunately, a lot of stores don't communicate with each, with each other, which I think is quite a, sh a shame, honestly, because I feel like if these stores do spread it out a little bit more over the week slash weekend, then a lot of these players that are willing to travel, they'll just be more at each event, right? They can kind of share share the, the, the load of the Lorcana players, if that makes sense. But uh, yeah, Brennan, you were saying this is pretty common, unfortunately, right? Uh, the terminology I used, I said it was an ancient problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay, there you it's go. pretty much happened for as long as I've I've these things have been going on for as long as I've been in the space. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of factors there. Uh, Lacana's, in this case, Lacana, what used to be Flesh and Blood and what could be in the other game, is not the only game that these stores are selling and are interested in. They sell many other products. Uh, yeah, they also probably don't communicate with a lot of stores. And, um, you know, especially in the early stages of a game, Lacana has the the power of like the Disney IP. So it maybe gets taken a lot more seriously, but a lot of stores will not take like a brand new TCG, like super seriously. Cause a lot of things come into the space and like die out 
and shouldn't be taken seriously, to, to be frank. So, um, yeah, it happens. Uh, it's part of it. The best you can do is talk to your store and be like, hey, there's another store having out this time. Maybe if you moved it, you could make more money because more people exactly. would come. And then they're like, yep. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you got to hustle a little bit on that side. And that that is a lot of what Lorcon is going to be in the first year, by the way. You're going to need to... F- fucking hustle to get into to get into events to compete it just it's one of those games like i would look towards one piece because of the powerful ip the interest in the game which is good that is very good for all of us you are going to need to hustle to get into these events and that's just going to be a part of it there's going to be a whole nother axis you need to compete on which is just like can i get into these freaking events um all right last order of business here poland talk to me about what you guys are doing next weekend uh, so myself and Moyen will be attending the 10,000 euro Poznan event in Poland. Um, I don't mind sharing a little bit of backstory here. I probably mm-hmm. shouldn't, but I will. Uh, I was in talks to kind of host slash cast slash produce slash basically run the entire stream for this event. I was super excited about it because it's like the biggest EU event so far. Um, but things didn't really work out with the organizer. Nevertheless, I do really want to play i'm still going with uh one or two buddies here from ireland gonna meet up with moyen i believe species come on a few a few other um you know creators from from eu but it's gonna be a lot of fun i just want to get some some prep in i know that kind of sounds funny because like you know I'm, I'm trying to i'm also trying to get in a little bit of a casting angle but as much practice as i can get i think is really really good mm. especially leading up to these uh these challenge events but I do want to say, and this is like many events, when you when you hear ten thousand euro, right? Oh my god, like that's a pretty large amount of money. It's in product, guys. It's not in <laughs> cash. And a lot of people, a lot of organizers will do this to attract attention because technically, in product value, that is what it's worth. But uh, and I think the split as well, as far as I'm aware, is it's like a very high end split, which some players will like, right? Like I'm pretty sure um, day day one, everyone plays. I think it's about two hundred and fifty six odd players, and then. Day two will be top 32, but yeah, between this week and next week, myself and Moyen will be prepping as much as we can. Uh, be interesting to see what deck uh, both of us settle on. Maybe if, maybe it's different, maybe it's the same, but it's going to be at least, I think your very first like real in-person competitive event, Moyen, right? How are, how are you feeling about it? Yeah, I've, I've not played any Lorcana in-person event at all, so I'm looking forward to it. There's still a few options um, in terms of what we could bring for, mm-hmm. for the deck, and I think it will... Also, the biggest part of that decision making will be our read on the matter, and mm-hmm. that that might still shift uh, in the next week. So it's not like we can decide yet, but I, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, we've got we've got Tia's uh, last. I don't want to say last, but like a big big tournament this weekend. I think it's going to be the 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 two K online. So. Maybe we'll see another meta shift from that event, which is going to be quite interesting. Obviously, we'll be talking about the deck lists and stuff from that next week, but. Yeah, seems like the the meta shifts quite a lot in Lorcana, uh, you know, week to week. But then again, like, will a lot of these players going to Poland look at all of these lists from this previous online event and then take that right? Like, it is very much about getting a read on what the majority of players are going to bring. If they're all just going to bring Ruby Amethyst, you just bring the same Ruby Amethyst deck, but Tech for the Mirror, you want to bring something that absolutely dominates on it. So it's going to be an interesting time for sure. There's something funny you said. You're like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm doing all this prep, but I'll probably be in the booth. It's like, I have a pretty hard line opinion on this. Definitely a hot take. And my, my hot take is that if you can't play the game at the highest level, you probably shouldn't be in the booth. Um, and there's some the exceptions. Are some casting? Yeah, in the casting. Yeah, in the booth. booth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I, I 100% some, agree. Yeah. There are some exceptions. There are some actual mm-hmm. phenomenal hosts that in the right production setup exist outside of like the actual casting part. They are hosting the event and I think that is fine. But ultimately, I think that what happens a lot in terms of casting is like, people can get complacent and they can stop keeping up with the game, stop trying to be competitive. Maybe they're not testing uh, to play it, to play it at the highest level. And I think it translates in a very negative way. I, I vastly prefer casters that are very invested in playing the game competitively, understand at a high level, and then use that additional level of talent to translate that to the layman, to the average watcher. Like I think it's super important when casters get on there and just crack jokes and talk about random shit that's not the game. I, I cannot yeah. stand it. Destroy the tournament experience. Yeah. I, yeah. Honestly, I think um, basically, okay, so not anyone that's like a great player can just suddenly be a great caster as well. But I think you cannot be a great caster without at least being good at the game. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't need to be like the best player in the world. But, I, but what I'm getting at is basically any, play, ex, any experience competing is also going to improve your casting. Um, I think. 
Yeah, so, definitely. I think you can't I mean, do enough prep. Like, I think I think that if you're casting, you should be prepping harder because you need to know every single deck, right? Like, if you're actually playing, you can hone in on a deck and you can have you can have matchup plans, you have game plans, you can understand what other decks do. I think when you're casting, you have to prep even more. You need to know every single deck from the pilot perspective. Yeah, you know, every line that each deck does, every matchup spread, everything. Like, oh, why does this player put this card in this deck for this matchup? It, it, there's, there's so much prep that goes into it, but... Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy that, honestly. I, I, I enjoy analyzing the the, the meta overall. Uh, I also like diving deep into individual decks, but I mean, I've, I've always enjoyed casting. I've casted with, with Brendan for different card games now. I've, uh, I think I've cast with, oh yeah, I did cast with Moyne for, for like a tiny little bit, which, which yeah. was a lot of fun. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I will, okay, this is a little bit unrelated, but I will say one of my favorite moments I've ever watched of casters was actually brendan and fresh lobster at my tournament for marvel snap the uk i swear these guys were talking so analytically and the difference is it's exactly what you said there's so many events i watch where there's like a really high stakes game say it's like semi-finals or finals and the casters are kind of just talking and joking to each other just like they're not even focusing on the game right like you know you've got moments like that and it does add to the entertainment but when you really feel like they're not even focusing on the game it really takes away from the experience so um i think it's like super 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 important honestly and you know, yeah. fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I get to to cast some really high end, uh, or like you know, high competitive lore kind of events. I'd, yeah. I'd be excited for it. I think that if you do get the early casting bids, you also have the opportunity to set the standard for your fellow casters and all the casters that will come after you. That this is the mm-hmm. standard that you adhere to, because I feel like it's unfortunately it's extremely common for your casters, people that get these gigs, especially on a recurring basis. I've seen it many, many, many times uh, to get complacent and be like, I'm casting. I don't have to prep. I don't have to prep. I don't have to practice. And and it is a it is a, it's a disservice to the game, um, and that's why I'm excited when players, people that are very interested in the game, very invested in the game, do get the casting gig because I feel like it translates really well. Like Boyd said, not every player can be a caster, but every caster damn well better be a player, <laughs> in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, all right, the last thing I want to talk about is the Cerebus Den 1K list, um, which you can find in the notes if you don't have it pulled up yet. I just want to talk a little bit about Amethyst Steel and where y'all think that is. Um, in the current meta game, because it's not a list that I've experimented with very much. It did come second at this tournament. Moin, have you had a chance to play around with this or Kawa? Uh, I haven't played around with it, but I'm assuming this is a very similar list to what uh, Zach Bivens brought to. There was like that big 8K in in uh, Atlanta, I think, about two weekends ago, and I saw a lot on Twitter about them kind of talking about this whole perception of people. People saying like, oh, they, you know, you got to bring like an, an expensive deck or like one of these top decks to play. And if you actually look at like the cost of this deck in terms of in terms of monetary value and stuff, it's like quite cheap. And I found it to be very reminiscent of when I brought a deck that was really cheap to like the Vienna event. But yeah, I mean, from from a overall perspective, looking at this deck, when you say uh, Steel Amethyst, people will probably initially think of the whole Jafar combo, but the decks drastically changed mm. now. It's, it looks just to be like a very tempo oriented orientated deck with a lot of the Ruby Amethyst pieces, or sorry, like the Amethyst pieces from the Ruby Amethyst deck. And then just just like good steel cards, right? You've got the Captain Hook, Mr. Shmi combo, Benja to deal with all of the uh, items, especially like the flutes and the sorcerer spell books running around, also the Lucky Dimes. Um, you've also got the, and then along came Zeus to deal with the locations. Interesting to see that there's maybe not a rise of titans uh rise of the titans in this deck but i also want your opinion on on that card in general you guys because maybe that card like maybe zeus is just better because it's a song and rise of titans isn't that you kind of just want to play that type of card instead mm-hmm. but yeah i'll pass it over to you mind just the, your thoughts on the deck um so just to make sure we're, we're talking about the zach bivens uh steel amethyst uh, so we're talking no, about I, michael majors uh, yeah I, I can put it in the chat for you there Mine. Yeah, should, steel. Should and i should have clarified the non-jafar amethyst steel obviously we've seen a lot of amethyst steel um yeah and this is from uh just to confirm this is from a uh, laughing dragon 1k i think there was another event the cerberus dan 2k but yeah this is the laughing dragon 1k event but yeah, that's a lot of a lot of the amethyst pieces. You got the Pinocchios. You got all the, the entire Merlin Madame Min package. Which again, if you're not playing this, are you really playing amethyst these days? Yeah, it's funny how a lot of these amethyst lists, amethyst X lists, are almost mono amethyst at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. even yeah. Ruby amethyst it's is crazy. Similar. Yep. I mean, so this just like I don't know. It kind of looks like a s- similar thing to what Ruby amethyst tries to do, just more aggressive. So it's just 
has the steel package instead of the ruby package. So what does that enable? I think the biggest thing it enables is just the SME, some mm-hmm. um, some item hate and some tempo songs so that once you are slightly ahead on the board, you can run away with the board with stuff like Strength of a Raging Fire and Zeus. Um, I actually, I actually haven't gotten around to testing this all that much, but it, it is it is a, a way of playing this color combination that we is not is, is kind of uncommon, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I still see some potential in it. So yeah, it, see, it seems like 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 you were mentioning, Brandon. This seems like the kind of Ruby Amethyst version, except you just strip the Ruby out and put a few just very good steel cards in it, and maybe the deck. I mean, again, we haven't really done the testing, but maybe it performs even better than Ruby Amethyst because. If you look at these cards, it seems like it just wants to go faster, whereas the Ruby Amethyst deck always has the flexibility to go a little bit slower and has like the removal tools and stuff like that. But when you add a card like Mr. Smee into a deck, like you're 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 you want to go fast for sure. It's just a super, super powerful two drop. And Cap Nook is another one of these one drops that's uh really got into a turn two Pinocchio. Like against, against, mm, against locations as well, right? Any challenger cards are just like super, super effective. Yeah, I feel like this this style and this list has been overshadowed by Jafar, and it hasn't potentially hasn't gotten the attention that it should have. This set, uh, it's not something I even considered exploring. I was like, oh, let's play, let's play Steam, let's, let's cut Jafar, which seemed to be like one of the best cards, the best additions. But I'm interested to try it, Moyen. If I had to, like, you were put on the spot, and you don't have to be correct, mm-hmm. but I was like, and it's like, what's the best deck right now in this moment? What would you pick? Um. Hard. <laughs> I, 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 personally, at this point, I think it might still be Sapphire Steel. Um, knowing that it has a little bit of the weakness against the uh, red-blue. But I think other than that, its matchup spread is, 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 is like insanely good. And red-blue, I still don't expect to be too popular, at least in tournaments. I, I think in, on the ladder, it's creeping up. But mm-hmm. for tournaments, I still don't see that much red-blue. So I, mm. I think... My shot would be set for a for now. I, I think I would hard agree, honestly. <laughs> I was talking to Moyen about it a little bit before, and I, I think I think matchup spread wise, um Sapphire Steel just does just does everything that you want it to do. Um there's always I mean there's always the risk with every deck that you can brick and maybe that deck is just hard because like your 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 big uh one of your big combo pieces is obviously a whole new world and when that doesn't work it sucks a little bit, but I think the reason why that deck works really well with the whole new world is you just got such solid five drops, such such solid five yeah. drops in that plus list. When that, that, it, plus when it doesn't reel, it's it's if it hits Flavor Shem. And oh yeah, your card draw engine is ridiculous. And, still, yeah, like, you don't even need the wheel. Yeah, exactly. It's so so good. Yeah. But, what, do you, uh, what do you think, Brandon? Let's put the question to you. I, I would probably take Ruby Amethyst at this point. I just think the matchup spread is super solid. Um, like I just feel like. I feel like it's at a point where it, you know, maybe I'd have to figure out where exactly the metagame was in terms of like what tournament I'm attending, but I feel like the list could be tuned in a way where I'm like maybe above 50% to everything. Like even if it's very slight, I think I can be like very close to being above. And I just, I love that consistency. I've loved the consistency of Ruby Amethyst for a long time. Um, And yeah, right now it's, I mean, literally since the beginning of the set, it's just been doing, it's been performing extremely well for me. Like every time I've had my attention taken away from Ruby Amethyst, um, I go down this rabbit hole and then I just end up coming back every single time I come back. I think, but I do think right now we might be at a low point for Ruby Amethyst because I think um, this new version of of um, Steel Song that that's popped up last week and is, is is still being played, the one that cuts Beast and Tinker by, I think that one has a good matchup against Ruby Amethyst. And Ruby Amethyst, so far, no one has really found a way to like build it in a, in a way where it's still a good deck, but also better against uh, Amber Steel. So I think that deck is kind of pushing back Ruby Amethyst a little bit, and then Sapphire Steel is also pretty good against Ruby Amethyst. So it it, it is. At this point, I think it actually does have some weaknesses, but of course, it's the go tech. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested because we're going to pick up the metagame talk next week, obviously, um, especially in the mm-hmm. context of Poland and things like that. But we're about to go. You know, we're coming off of for me what was Flesh and Blood, a little bit of a grind for Flesh and Blood for the Pro Tour, and now Moyen Regionals with One Piece. We're about to go into like full scale Wakana ramp up, mm-hmm. um, and I think mm-hmm. our opinions about the metagame. You know, no matter how far we are, are going to change because the metagame is, of course, just always in flux. And I'm excited to see how we change our our sort of thoughts on the current state um, of the game as we prepare to target specific tournaments. Uh, so yeah, I think that over the next couple of weeks we're gonna be we're gonna be doing a little cooking. Um, anyway, let's head into our spilled ink. 
uh, section inside the listener question section. If you want to get your comment right out on next week's pod, you can shoot us a comment on YouTube and we'll get it queued up. Passing over to you, Ko. Yeah. So first comments from the ego. Hey guys, I've been really trying to enjoy this game so far and do enjoy listening to you guys and your insights. However, I'm hitting a point where I'm getting burnt out. It feels like no matter what I do with what I play, my opponent has every possible answer for everything I do. What advice would you give to someone who is strongly considering dropping the game altogether because of his seemingly horrible luck? For context, I go back and forth between Amber Steel and Sapphire Steel, but somehow get matched up with people who have outs to every possible thing I do, regardless of color combo. This is a skill issue. Am I just not, not meant to be for this game, or am I just missing something in my gameplay? I'm currently sitting in gold five in Pixelborn with no way to get out. Hmm. Moin. Um, so I don't... Okay, I need to think about how to answer to this because, um, well, it's it's possible to be unlucky over a short period period of time, but the long the more games you play, the less likely it is that um that that luck is the factor of why you are not having the success that you want to be having, and it is never the solution to blame um to blame the game on your on on your uh, I don't know on your failure I guess on on your missing success because it's never the game's fault it's like yes it can be temporarily you you might be unlucky but uh, if you play well enough that there's no one it's it's not even an argument to say oh I'm unlucky as a player like that doesn't exist mm-hmm. yep. yeah I think that the hard answer is that yes it is a skill issue. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should quit. There's probably yeah. some like macro gameplay stuff that you're messing up, like fundamentals of the game, like how you're inking, like your core game plans, how you think you play into specific decks. It's probably just like a core misunderstanding of how the game functions, um, which is hard to analyze, right? Because it's not as easy as like, oh, I need to change my deck list by by this amount. I need to be playing this card because it really comes down to fundamentals. And I think if you're hitting consistent issues with uh, with success and you're playing at a rank that is, like you mentioned, in, in something like gold, then it probably is more of a fundamental issue. I still, I think I think I can appreciate how that would be frustrating. I think a lot of us have been there one, one time or another. Like, I know for me, because of the podcast, because of the, you know, playing Flesh and Blood and the years I've been playing games, like when I play games, I do feel like I have to be the highest rank. Like if I'm not the highest rank, I kind of just feel like a failure. And I definitely get into these these little lumps where I might get stuck somewhere before the highest rank. And I'm like, oh shit. Because <laughs> then I'm like, oh, I'm just like a total fraud. And yeah, but, it, but it your, a- your first, re- just, just to jump in, mm-hmm. your first response is always, wait, do I actually suck at this game, right? It's never, oh, am I just an unlucky player? Yeah, it is always, do I suck at this game? And it's like, I I go through, do I suck at games in general? But ultimately, the answer is usually just yes. Like, you are just making mistakes. Um, You are just, you are just misunderstanding something. It's hard to, it's hard to know about something or, you know, understand something that you don't know exists, right? If you don't know you're making a mistake, you don't even know there's a possibility of you making a mistake in these scenarios, right? It's like some macro level thing and you don't even know it exists. Yeah, it's hard to correct that but ultimately you just got to zoom out a bit and try to figure out where where the problem exists and probably build up back from you know close to zero build back up the fundamentals try to look at other the the best thing you can do and i think it's consistent across many card games actually across many disciplines just go watch somebody who's better than you play the game and analyze every single play they do and figure out where the incongruencies are figure out where you would have made a decision they made a different decision it doesn't mean they're always right but analyze the sort of the difference there and yeah that's 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 what i do i just like when i can't figure something out i just try to mimic the people that i think are better than me also it is very difficult like i i'll be honest over the weekend when i was in the the star wars tournament i was i was very very hard on myself i i lost to what i considered to be some not so very good players uh and i was i was really really hard on myself and i'll i'll be honest this tournament was the first time i let something really get to me and when i let it get to me it it threw the rest of my it literally threw the rest of my tournament so it's something you really need to learn and i'm i'm still learning as i'm playing these like competitive events is like as frustrating as it can be when if you want to say you lose to you know your opponent top decks the perfect card these things can happen unfortunately and you, you have to be able to kind of move on and take it and just say you know i'm going to pick up i'm going to just keep going with my game plan i'll make it next game and um, it's about being able to continue on and not 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 giving up right always trying to improve so that's always easier um 
said than done, right? But I, I would mimic what Brendan said. Just look at other players and see how how other people kind of uh, you know manage situations like this because. It may look like, you know, you may look at this podcast and say, for example, even Moyen Moyen's, oh, um, Moyen's rank one, it must be so easy. It's 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 not. It's really, really, really hard. I mean, Moyen just spoke about going on a crazy losing streak and, you know, yeah. that could affect someone's someone's confidence as well. But Moyen's been doing this for a long time. Brendan's, but we, we've all been playing cards for, for a long time, but uh, it doesn't mean that we don't let things get to us sometimes, right? So it's just yeah. kind of part of the, part of the reason we, we play card games. We always want to improve. I feel like, I feel like we always want to become better players, no matter what. Yeah, it's, so it's basically TLDR. If you lose too much, yes, it's because you're bad, but we're all bad and everyone mm -hmm. can improve. And we always need to focus on on what you can change and not what you cannot change, um, because there's no point in that. And then if you always, always um, strive to improve, then you will improve and you will get, get good at, at the stuff that you want to be good at. Not, not I mean, that, that applies to everything in life. Everything. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Moyen definitely does make it look easy. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, there's a also, few players. You know, go ahead. I, I guess it's it's also it's also good to not be too emotionally attached. Like, let's say I lose to someone at a tournament, and they tell me, "Oh, at this point, why didn't you do this? Or maybe you should have done this." Like, um, it, it's not always easy, but to improve, the the best mindset you can have is like to absolutely listen and to to see. Whether you can agree with it, discuss with them, okay, maybe maybe I did a mistake there. Do you know yeah. what happens to me so much, and I'm sure it's happened to you guys as well. And it really happened in paper when, like, I make a decision on the turner in the game, I do it, and as soon as I do it, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I mean, we, we've all we've all we've yeah. all been there, right? Yeah, that's but punting. even in those, <laughs> yeah, if, even in those moments of frustration, right? The biggest thing, honestly, is realizing what you did wrong. Even though it sucks and you understand, okay, I might have literally lost this game because of what I just did. You know why you lost that game and you just don't make that mistake again, right? It's super, super important. Would you be like, fuck, I'm so shit. Oh my God, I give up and I'm never going to play this game again, right? You know? Yeah. I think the hardest, like, it's it's not hard to lose. It's hard to lose, uh, like, without direction, without the ability to analyze, like, what actually went wrong. Because you can fall into those traps of thinking that potentially you're unlucky or that it is unsolvable or that other people are just more talented than you. Like, all this, all, all that stuff is fundamentally just bullshit. Also, the biggest issue is if you win and suddenly <laughs> you think you, you play perfectly all the time. Like, e e even, even I, you know, if let's say, let, okay, let's say any competitive player, if they just go on a crazy tournament streak, if, if, if just because of that they think they're, they're playing perfectly and they're the best, then, you know, I think that's the, an even bigger fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Losing doesn't mean you're bad. Winning doesn't mean you're, you're good. Let's, let's put it at that. Yeah. All right, next one's from Banable Harka. I figure I'll mention this here just to try to get more eyes on it. I've been trying to raise the alarm on a very real issue with the proposed two-game format that apparently not many others have noticed. The format creates a very real incentive for teams or friends to agree beforehand to play best of one and have the losing player concede game two. This maximizes points across a team slash play group and will ultimately give teams willing to do this an advantage. I'm not sure that anyone will abuse this, but the reality is that it is asking to be abused. Once you lose a game... Uh, once you lose game one, you are playing for one point, but your opponent is playing for two. You might say that a person acting in self-interest would never concede, but even that isn't true. If the agreement is arranged in advance with players playing on top on a top team, it is reasonable to assume that they will eventually take a game off a teammate either in this event or the next, and in the long run, the conclusion will win out. If you go approximately even against teammates, you will get more points by engaging in the agreement. Full stop. Um, true. Yeah. So every, I mean, everything, but, yeah, everything you said is right. I'm everything sure. you said is correct. There should not be but, an extra point awarded to going 2-0, in my opinion. It's silly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, all we can do is discourage the type of behavior if you see it reported and hope, hope uh, something's done about it. But yes, that part of the rule is kind of asking to be exploited. And um, I, like, we can just hope that it won't be exploited to its fullest extent, it's, I guess. It's, it's interesting. I had, I had a few. So in Star Wars, if you tie, it's just a double game loss. So both players lose. Flesh and blood. So yeah. So if it went to, uh, if games went to time, literally the amount of people. Now I I, sh I should have like it's it's an interesting thing, right? It's like should you do this or should you not do this? And it's kind mm -hmm. of what you think, right? People are like, oh, like you know, we're both gonna lose. Let's just die roll and see who wins. Yeah. Right. Flesh and blood. That's that that's against that, the rules. <laughs> like yeah, yeah yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying. That happens so that happens so much. 
over the weekend. And this was just now this this was just me because it went to time. So I just said no. And realistically, some people are like, why are you say no? You should say yes. Maybe you're gonna get more of more of this. Maybe you're gonna win, go higher. But I'm like, if I win based on the die roll, then in my opinion, right, just because I'm there to play, my score at the end is not gonna actually represent how I played. Like if a game goes to time and stuff like that. There were mistakes I made in those games where I literally could have won the game. So for me, at that current time, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. So uh, I, I really hope that they discourage this as that game evolves. As you mentioned, Brandon, it's like banned in Flesh and Blood. Like you mm -hmm. can't do that. So uh, yeah, exactly what Moyne said. If you see this type of behavior in these big Lorcana events, just report it. Do, do, do what you can. You know. Yeah. Why, why the extra point to two L? Um, yeah. I, 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 like I there's some answers in the comments that we we'll get to, but I, I still don't like it. Yeah, I think it's like a novel idea. Like it's, I just, I don't think that it works well in reality. I think that when you, when you face a situation where the, you are, in, you are incentivized, like the EV is much higher to concede, right? Like it is double versus a single. Um, it, like you're just asking people to do this. Uh, I, I, and you're like with a teammate. I think it will happen without teammates too. Like someone, you, it's probably going to be against the rules to ask people, Hey, well, you can see so I can get the 2 0 and you can't. Um, it, but people are still going to do it. And like it already, it already happens in other games, even when you aren't that incentivized. Like if you're going to time and stuff like magic or going like fab, people are like, Oh, maybe you should just concede. Um, uh, because it'll be a double loss. Like, ugh, why? Maybe that, that part will get fixed, but I think there's going to be some growing pains with the system specifically because of that <laughs> specifically sure our next comment is from calvin three points for two wins eliminates intentional draws at the end of the day you will always want to win all games uh i mean it does discourage so if you go one up one oh up it does discourage the winning player from playing slow if that makes sense but I mean, so playing slow, <clears throat> just so people know, if you haven't played at a tournament, playing slow and playing to a draw is against the rules. <laughs> mm. um, so if someone tries to slow play you to a loss, you can call a judge and you can say, watch this match for slow play, and they will actively watch their game actions, and those people can get disqualified. Um, that doesn't mean that that is a perfect system that stops that from happening, but... Um, yeah, if someone tries to take you to a game loss or a game draw via playing slow, you can absolutely call a judge is 100% against the rules and they cannot do that. Uh, I don't know if this person is actually referring to IDs in order to like ID into top eight. Like we get there, like we both ID, like we both agree to like not play the match. Um, like this would incentivize against that because again, if you go 2-0, uh, you would get the But I'm also point. pretty sure that's not allowed in Lord Cala. Like, I'm pretty sure IDing, again, well, I guess we don't have comprehensive rules. Whether, yet, whether you ID like, verbally and, and do the like actually do intentional drop or sorry intentional draw or you just like do it by playing the game like they're kind of mm -hmm. the same thing like i don't even know if you can write too many rules against that like in flesh and blood it's not a possible thing because a draw is a double game loss it's actually way worse mm -hmm. than a game loss so people yeah. just don't do it um but yeah i just want to mention that in case people don't know that it's like let's say in the best of three format that we used to exist yep. in, in Larkana, it was actually like you could it became pretty apparent if you're in a ruby amethyst mirror like oh i won game one maybe i should just slow like maybe i should just draw it out because i auto win and like let's be real morality aside that's a reasonable strategy but there are rules in place to stop you from being egregious about it like you still have to yeah. take a reasonable amount of game actions within a specific but, amount of time but still like um it's only the egregious part, right? Because there's still some extents to which you can play slower than you would usually, and still play in like a, in a reasonable manner, and that's that never that cannot get punished because mm -hmm. like you're playing in a reasonable time. It's just you decided to think like a few seconds longer on each decision. Yeah, and that 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 can still be an issue in card games. I want to say, even if you're one hour up, and there would not be an extra point for going to zero, like if there's still one extra point to be gained, you still always want to win game two, right? Yeah. It's not like Oh, oh, I only want to win game two if it gives me two extra points, not one extra point. So I don't so I don't agree with that uh, argument that's being made by some people. And also, I don't think it inherently even eliminates uh, um, intentional draws entirely because what if you both make top cut if you both get one more point? And you know that. Like that that's still a situation where, we, where people might be incentivized to ID. And that's not eliminated just because you could get three points if you maybe you only need one more. Mm -hmm. uh, next comment is from Yarn, just tagging me, saying the unique cards in the PVE game, they release an alternate art card. You can also just find them in packs, but they just have different art. Yes, I actually did 
see this last week after the pod. So thank you for clarifying that. They're not doing the thing that we mentioned that is quite common in car games. Yeah. They, they, Very they might do it down, <laughs> down the line because like like it, 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 it might come eventually. But right now it's it's a good thing, right? That they're just alternate art cards. Yeah. Um, Very surprising. Yeah. Um, Surprising. Uh, surpri- Very yeah. good, but surprising. Absolutely mm-hmm. not industry standard. <laughs> I'm happy they're doing it. Like if they can score some points with having a little bit of integrity and investing in their player base, I'm all for it. I am I'm personally being a part of TCGs for a while now. I'm tired of just getting bled by every every company in every way possible at any time so that they can make more money and make a better margin. It's like it's it's nice that they're willing to do something like this and make it completely optional. That that is a good thing. And I think that they should be applauded for that. Yep. I agree. Next comes from Big Belly. The extra point eliminates intentional draws and keeps the draws from being worth uh, too much, I think. Too much in the long run. Because if someone two owes the extra point, it will elevate them above the draws. Also, new format is day one only. Best of three, still day two, cut on top eight. Just a detail I think you guys missed. I, I, I didn't I don't miss think that. Missed it, but is we BO3 did. three day two, actually. I thought it was only top it, it, cut. It, yeah. I mean, Wait, top, is it day, day, day two is top cut, right? No. Um, so like, let's say Flesh and Blood Pro Tour, there's 14 rounds, you would split them across two days and you would top eight day three. Yeah, it, it depends on the tournament, but I think what they meant by day two is probably top cut. Okay, okay. So then I did understand that, yeah. But but when you say day two, like, this, so if there's going to be a 32 player top cut, that's going to be best of three, right? Or if it's 16 no, player, or if it's... The, yeah, see, so we are confused. No. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes in tournaments, they will cut and they will cut to a top 64, top 32, and then that will just be played out like Swiss uh, still. Mm -hmm. But I think what they're alluding to is that the day two cut, so it only is best of three in top eight. That's my understanding. It's not best of three in like top 32 or top 64. I think it is. I I, I think entire top cut is best of three. Like just top eight or... No, the entire top cuts. Like whatever the top cut is. If it's like top 64, then starting from that. That's interesting because I've never heard top 32 or top 64 be referred to as top cut i've only heard top eight referred to so i think i think top cut is just the 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 cut that's being made after the swiss portion of the tournament interesting so yeah in flesh and blood when they cut to day two they mostly do it to eliminate people that are not live to cash or anything and then you can go play a different Mm -hmm. tournament but it's still swiss like the day two cut is still swiss so like all x2 i I think in most i think in most card game tournaments it's it's standard that like after top cut it's it's just uh, best of something and no longer Swiss. Interesting. Just a limb after top cut. I'm pretty sure? sure in Magic it's still it's still Swiss as well. That's okay, weird. Interesting. Is that how it is in One Piece? Like you cut? Yeah, in One Piece, Half Stone, it's always been top cut too. Interesting. Single limb or double limb. Interesting. Yeah, so if you know any more details on that or you can confirm Please what Big, Big Belly said, let us know. Um, that would be interesting. Yeah, next comment is from Crisco Pirate. Play mats are 100% collectible and can be high value. I've played match against people with $200 plus mats. Why? What? I mean, this. We have a different understanding of what high value is. Yeah. Also, so also, I mean, also this, if you've played against people with these mats, I mean, that's that's cool, right? You, you sit down against the play. I mean, I think that's what the, what these companies are trying to do with these play mats is like, mm-hmm. oh, I sit down against the player, they have a top eight play mat. Oh, I'm scared. They're a really good player. But I mean, they're using the mat, which surely surely devalues it the more you use it right i think this person yeah. understood what i meant by collectible collectible i meant like had integrity can hold value and yeah mm. it's like a reasonable thing for people to uh invest in play mats they're just not they're not like mm. card uh, cards are designed like they are made in a way that they sh- they cannot or should not with a reasonable level of complexity be faked that is not the case for play mats like it, it is not like you can yeah so b- basically but i think when we talked about sub when, when we talked about these prizes, we went have, like we don't want one of the top prizes to be a playmat because um, a playmat doesn't sustain your flight to North America. As a playmat doesn't sustain your rent. It's uh, it's like a nice bonus, right? But yeah, cards can it's be not, worth it's a not, few yeah, thousand, maybe. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> and if you play card games for any amount of time, you realize that playmats are freaking. I don't know. They stack up. I'll tell you that. <laughs> like you'll have like hundreds at some point and. I don't know. My Everybody first just few needs One Piece one. tournaments. I've played with the uh, with the paper playmat you get in the starter deck, just so my <laughs> opponents think I'm bad at the game. <laughs> a rubber ra- a rubber band around your deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, um, I would 100 percent maintain my stance that playmats are not collectible. Doesn't mean you can't collect them, but and also 200 dollars is nowhere near the value we're looking for. Like 
rises to sustain professional play. And you might think that's not what professional play is about, but it's a huge part of sustainability and playing games professionally is selling promotional prizes that you get for cash to now fund playing more events or maybe pay your rent or something like that. Even if you don't agree with it, that is just how it is. Mm -hmm. Next comment from Harrison. Brendan, I can't wait to beat you in Atlanta. Bro, why me? Brendan makes it to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, first of all. What do you mean, bro? Why are you? We're going to the EU one. What, what, what do you mean? <laughs> first of all, thank, thank you for assuming that I would be there and that I would get a ticket. That's very nice of you, but uh, I did not. <laughs> Second of all, what the fuck? <laughs> why me? <laughs> what did I do wrong? Uh, oh, I love what Brendan did here. So the next one is just a lot of people commented. <laughs> Star Wars the limited tier list when you know I, I I'm not gonna say too much but we we have discussed maybe maybe making a podcast around this game but I think uh, it, I, I, I don't know I, all I say is I'm really enjoying the game at the moment but um since that tournament it's kind of a similar situation for me at least with the Lord Kana thing now I'm not really gonna be engaging with the game too much until their equivalent of like the stitch promo thing comes out this month or at least i think that comes out the last month before set two so uh i wish i could play it more it's just you know trying to balance card games is is, is hard at times but i will say if you are interested in get, like even just trying out the game definitely try it out i think we can all all agree that you know we don't we'd all recommend the game for sure yeah, like it's, it's fun. really fun I, I made the tier list on like uh on tabletop simulator just laying it all out and i don't even think we saved it I have a screenshot. Um, you can, yeah, but that, you can that, Venmo that me not a few hundred nice. dollars. <laughs> it would be so funny as well because like this tier list was made when like like no tournaments have gone on. So I, I'd be I'd first actually, time reading I'm the more, cards, by the way, as well. Yeah, yeah I'm more I just, curious I just to read the card and threw it into a tier and then and then with every card. Yeah, I'm really I'm it. really curious to see it now because uh, <laughs> I could actually judge this tier list and be like, oh, this is right or this is wrong. It's pretty yeah. accurate to be honest. Like it's just based on fundamentals, two for one cheap costs, like flexibility, like it's it's pretty even if it's not like the best constructed deck it's not an amalgamation of the best cards like those are still the best cards in the game like i don't know yeah i i, I don't know if i told you brandon but uh you know there was a card that you mentioned to me briefly it's like force throw it's yeah. like uh it's the card mm -hmm. that basically you can discard one of your opponent's cards and you deal damage to one of their units yeah, equal to the cost of that card so there's two ways you like that card's played so much so you could basically discard your opponent's card or you can discard your own high cost card to then deal damage right if you want like the higher higher damage that card's been so good that Kim played it in a non-red deck and paid three for it because it was still yeah. that good. The so, fact that that card was not recognized as the best card in the game when we first tried at SW is my thesis for maybe we should make a freaking podcast because that card is so <laughs> obviously broken. It just it's so good. But uh, no, in, re in there was reality, there go ahead. There was also a removal spell that like scales with the amount of resources you pay for it. And it's just like at every cost, it's like good rate. Yeah, it was also a force for something. Yeah, and that that card was crazy too. And I think it wasn't played a lot when when we checked it. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of cra it's, it's it's crazy how, how many similarities it has between Lorcan as well. So you know, Lady Tremaine's effect. Yeah, she comes down. It's, it's, they it's from magic. It's called an edict effect. Like yeah, mm -hmm. like uh, dude, Star Wars Unlimited has literal magic cards. By the way, like Collected Company is a card. Like all these new card games, it's so funny because you can just look at the broken cards of magic, like in Lorcana, Wheel of Fortune, and you're just like, okay, mm -hmm. this is probably still broken in this game. Oh, yep, it is. Okay, easy. <laughs> um, but in reality, podcasts are like Horcruxes. Like every single one is just a part of your soul that is gone, and now you have to like it's it's a lot. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know if they're gonna, they're serious about OP. They said they're serious, but I know FFG has some decent management, but I'm pretty sure they're still owned by Asmodee. Asmodee? Yeah, Asmodee? they are. They are. Yeah, they are, yeah, yeah, that company is a pretty big turd. <laughs> I'll be honest. So that part hasn't changed. So I'm skeptical. The card I was talking about is Force Lightning. It even silences the card you're dealing damage to. What? Yeah. What is that? Doesn't it cost one as well? Yeah, it's crazy, right? I think it costs really cheap, yeah. All right, all right, next comment. Back to, back to Lord Kana. So... Uh, this comes from Connor with a official competitive play launching. What are you guys' thoughts on a limited list? Coming from Yu-Gi-Oh, it had a limited list right away when the game launched in 2002 that restricted power cards to one or two copies per deck. The thought is powerful cards are okay to exist at less copies per deck to make them less consistent and frequent instead of outright banning them. The other thought is certain cards are fine resolving once, but not many times in the course of the game. Yu-Gi-Oh has balance as well, which came later in 2004, but a core structure of that game is the limited list. Would this model work well for Lorcana? For example, if Merlin Rabbit was limited to one copy per deck, you're unlikely to see it on curve at turn four, but it's still a powerful card to see at the course of a long game. You'd play it very conservatively with a bounce 
to make sure your one copy doesn't get banished. I think that adds a more interesting dynamic rather than banning the card outright. Or is the game better suited to just leave everything either at four or banned? Curious on your thoughts. What are your guys' thoughts on bans in general? I think we did discuss this a little bit. Um but overall, right now, I just don't, I don't want to see it at all. But I have this, this, a, I have a hot yeah. Take. Go, go for, it. go for. So it. I have a hot take. Um, first, first thing, if I was looking at how to balance a game in, perpetu- or in perpetuity for an eternal format, I would definitely not look at Yu-Gi-Oh for, uh, for advice. They, uh, I think that Yu-Gi-Oh is a bit degenerate. I don't, I'm not saying the game's not fun, but I think their entire system is a bit degenerate, and they've kind of leaned into it, and it's kind of worked. Um, Richard Garfield said something on a podcast I listened to. Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic and many other great games, he said there's two options with the game. You either rotate or power creep. That's it. You have two options. Either power creep cards or you rotate them. Um, if you don't do one, the game will pretty much die for relatively obvious reasons. I am a strong believer in rotation and people hate rotation. They hate the cards rotating out of the format. They hate not being able to play with their cards. But ultimately, if you do not rotate a game, what you lead to is long ban lists like Yu-Gi-Oh! And Yu-Gi-Oh! is like one of the only ones that's kind of done it. And their ban list is extensive. Their limited list is extensive. It's kind of clunky, in my opinion. Um, but you can also run into the Flesh and Blood problem, which is Flesh and Blood is now a rotating game because of Living Legend format and they've sped it up. But prior to that, we had like three, we had like a year and a half of sets that did zero impact. Actual zero. And I promise you, that is infinitely worse than a couple of your cards rotating out of the game. It is so bad. Like, the game was in such a freaking bad state for so long because the only option to have cards be relevant is to power creep them in an eternal format. From what we understand about Larkana right now, it is eternal. And I think that will work for a long time, for a while, maybe one, two years, three years, who knows. But I do think that card game designers are faced with the fundamental paradigm you either rotate the game or you power creep it and rotating doesn't mean the cards are not playable it just means they enter a different format so you have two formats standard and i the think a, things like that a game a game that does it perfectly again uh it's one that we've all played hearthstone hearthstone is still a very very fun game to play and even though you know competitively it's not at its prime as it was a couple of years ago um I mean, power creep's definitely been a thing in that game, right? If you if you, if you log in the <laughs> Hearthstone they, they, right they, like, now, hold my beer. Let's do both. Oh, it's yeah, it's crazy. There's some cards like there's there's two cost cards that just like for a very minimal condition just draw you two cards and stuff like this. Like, there's a lot of card draw in the game, but I mean, rotation has happened in that game for like it's coming up. It's their 10 year anniversary this year. The game's still going really strong. I logged into it a couple of weeks ago, and it was still really really fun to play. So, uh, there's just another game that that shows that the rotation. Yeah, uh, works. And I mean, even with rotation, I mean, do you agree, Brennan, that it is one or the other, or do you think both has to happen? I, I kind of I think, think it, both will well, will happen inev- inevitably. Oh, they can both happen, but the idea is that it's one or the other. Is that you're either power creeping every set, or you're rotating, um, having a limited amount of sets be legal in your premier format, not your only format, your premier format. I do have to warn both you and Moyen right now, people freaking hate rotation because they've been burned no, by they've I, been burned I, by I, magic. I just, I yeah. understand it, but like, and, and even in Hearthstone, like, the the rotation's great, but it's the uh, the secondary format, which is wild, where you can play yeah. all the cards in the game. Is like it's um okay, I don't want to upset anyone, but it's 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 a joke. It's irrelevant uh, in comparison, and um I mean that, that that that's not great. But the thing is, okay, the cards that are rotating out that you will not have to play again. First of all you can disenchant them and get some value yep. out of them. Second of all, it's not like you're losing um, some like expensive card that now you attach value to and you bought it for some money, you have some good experience with it, and then suddenly you see this card in front of your hand and you're like, I guess I don't, like, there's no purpose for this anymore. So I think for like a physical game, it's... Um, it is very different for a physical dangerous. game. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I think mm. it works really well for Hearthstone for that fact that you mentioned that you can just like disenchant your cards and you get like a lot of value not a lot of value but like a decent amount of value that you can get like maybe 25 percent to 50 percent of the new set right i think that's super super important that's something that you can can't easily do with physical stuff because you literally have to sell on like if you if you feel like you have to sell on all of your cards to the previous set and then suddenly if this rotation happened then there's only a limited amount of players that actually want these cards because they actually it's not in the core format this whole type of thing 
The, so, there's an assumption happening here, which is that value is, is held at any point. So value is lost in both options. Value is lost uh, via rotation or power creep, because if they power creep, the games also exit the format. It's the same thing. Sure, but it, sure no, but it's not the same thing, because it feels very different, even if it's the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, but it's so an illusion. If, it's a complete if, fallacy, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, but, but the people like the illusion. The card, if the card <laughs> decreases in value just a little tiny bit every month, then that, that feels much better than if it goes from 100% to like... Yeah, almost literally like unplayable. Five cent. The idea yeah. is that you oh. have multiple formats, right? You have one format that is like eternal. Uh, they could also be a competitive format, right? You could have high level events at the eternal format, or you have a casual, mm -hmm. something like commander or multiplayer or PVE in Larkana. Yeah. Um, so they will maintain a value no matter one thing. But yeah, like we do have to point out that the value of a card is not necessarily lost by rotation in and of itself. It is also lost by power creep to an extent. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I guess to to get back to the question because the question yeah. was about the ban list, right? <laughs> it could yeah. work. About I actually think it could list. work. The limited list specifically, you know, if you limited yeah. like one whole new world, like that, like that's a pot, that's a reasonable way to balance things. Yes, mm. like I think it can work, but still at the same time, there's some part of me that doesn't like, um, let's say, let's say the most powerful card being only a, being able to include it once, and then I don't like the gameplay mechanic of how important it is who sees their one off powerful card. So I think that's the dangerous aspect of it, but I think other than that, it, it can work. Yeah, it becomes pretty high variance. So Magic also has this, like in, in formats like Vent Vintage, they have a uh, restricted list, so you can only play one of a card. Um, fortunately, in something like Vintage, you can also just like tutor for that card with like a million other cards and find it easily. But yeah, I think it's a possible option. Um, I'm interested to see how Lorcana balances itself in the future. I think the idea that they will just keep releasing sets and they'll keep having impact and everything will be balanced and they're not power creeping is completely unrealistic and, and absolutely impossible in perpetuity. Like they have to figure out like what the game plan is for the future, whether they're consistently power creeping with sets or they're finding a way to rotate cards out, whether with a limited list and a ban, ban restricted list or by creating multiple formats and having a rotating format. And, and, and about the rotation, I think like it sounds great on the surface level. I think the biggest challenge in it is actually uh, having the secondary tertiary formats not be irrelevant. If if people still care about these formats, I think rotation is a, it's an absolutely great thing. For sure. That's why Hearthstone is a bad example is because wild is like, yeah. it's so, I it's, mean, it's, it's, it's no, wild. But it's, it's wild. But still rotation is good for Hearthstone, but, yeah. uh, but it's just the secondary formats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild's not a super playable format. I mean, it is, but like nobody plays it. And um, I would look towards... Yeah. The problem is that, like, the, I think one of the one example that you can point to in the industry is Magic, and Magic, unfortunately, like, burnt a lot of people with its rotating system. That's why Flesh and Blood was able to be so successful. Flesh and Blood came out with this very naive value prop, and they're like non-rotating eternal card game. So Flesh and Blood doesn't technically have a rotating format, but it's a fucking rotating game. They just obfuscated through the system called Living Legend where uh, heroes accumulate points by winning tournaments, and when they accumulate X amount of points, a threshold, they rotate out. So it's that's a rotating four. I think that, that I've never heard that system in a card game, and I, I'm kind of intrigued by it. So it's good and bad. So let me let me let me give you an example of what's bad. You want to you want to get into flesh and blood. It's a hero based mm -hmm. gameplay. It's a it's a it, you're supposed to role play as your hero. You pick one hero, right? Yeah. Boyan, ask you ask me what deck should I buy? Am I going to suggest the best deck? If I give you the best deck, maybe it's deleted in two months. Yeah, which is actually what happened when you'd wanted to prep me for the world championship. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we could, we could, we, we could, you could learn this deck, but maybe it's banned when the world championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second deck we were going to get you on was Dromai, which just won the pro tour in in Los Angeles and has now rotated out. Yeah, yeah. So there are it's a it's it's a it's a fragile system to say the least. Sure. Uh, next comment is from Dan. I do disagree with you a little bit on your stance of non locals taking promos. From more casual LGS, I don't think anyone should expect uh, should be excluded because that hurts competition and devalues the prize. But it's also important that newer players can measure themselves within their region. Someone coming in and spiking the tournament, then leaving, does hurt that progression for newer players. The non-local player gets put on this pedestal that makes you feel like you are never good enough. I've seen it in Magic now that I have been taking a semi-retirement role from pro play, but this is really just the mindset that I've been helping people get past that mental barrier. That said, I think this will largely become a non-issue. The game is too new, and there isn't much comp much for a competitive player to aspire to. 
uh, I kind of... Oh, okay. Until this <laughs> recent announcement. Bigger tournaments and earning invites will draw competitive players away from stomping players in stores. That... Uh, a far away for a promo. I don't know. I wanted to say this for the first time listening and I really enjoy the podcast. I am subscribed and looking forward to the next one. Thank you for the sub. Um, it's really interesting. I, I had this similar conversation literally today. Uh, I don't know if it was an act- with an actual LGS owner or with someone just within the, the local I- Irish Lorcana community and they're talking about like, oh, it's not great. You know, these, these, and I'm like, this is just my opinion. You can agree or you can disagree with me, but when they call something a set championship and they give out a limited amount of these promos, for me, the Lorcana League it can be considered the, the casual format. Like that. And I don't want to discourage casual players from playing in the set championship because like, if you want to get better at the game and you want to try, like, definitely do it. But like, it, again, it also depends where you live and how many competitive players there are and blah, blah, blah. But like, I know me and a few buddies, exactly what Brandon said, we will be traveling to as many of these you know, stitch showdowns as possible, we will be competing because we are competitive players. Mm-hmm. This is at, at the time right now, like it's the best way for you to technically practice besides Pixel Born for future competitive events. And it's also a competitive prize, in my opinion. So, like, there's very little that you can do to stop this from happening. And yes, unfortunately, it could leave um, a bad taste in newer players' mouths from, from seeing this happen. But in my opinion, also, the, of course, it depends how many people are in your area, blah, blah, blah. But at least. <laughs> seems for ireland it is inevitable it, it, it will just mm-hmm. happen and i'm sure this has happened in many other card games as well right like yeah. it's, it's gonna be it's a hard thing to kind of combat i guess oh, what's i think oh, you you yeah. could light um light um put it in a different perspective where let's say you're, you're playing locals and you you know you're slowly getting better you're having fun at your tournaments and then you know these few very competitive events with better prices th- those mm-hmm. those will be like new testing worlds where you get to face some final bosses like really really yeah. good players and then like it will be the, even more satisfying to to beat these uh dan is 1000 percent right in six months to a year it'll be a completely irrelevant conversation because it won't happen because the competitive players will play the competitive events and these will be medium to low competitive events if I any do agree with if that. anybody mm. at any time feels entitled to a promo i think they're doing some wild mental gymnastics that they need to analyze how they approach life because look at it from the other perspective we always look at it from like you're a part of the local scene you support the store these people come in they steal your promo look at it the other side we could use the same argument someone spends money to travel they spend money for a hotel they they take money they take time off work they go to your store and they you shit on them are they not entitled that's not bad for them <laughs> or they are entitled to the promo because they spent money they spent time they spent effort surely we should be giving these promos to people who travel and who spend the most money to get here but nobody would have that conversation because it's ridiculous and it's equally as ridiculous as the first it, like no one is entitled to the promo it's a competitive event and you must compete and you must win to get it that's why it's that's why it's a prize um I do empathize, to be honest, with this the whole the whole thing with like people coming in, spiking. It's like, oh man, like we just get dunked on by these like random people that we don't know that don't support our store. But at the end of the day, it's a non-issue and it will be gone in six to twelve months as higher level competitive events come in. But I do think that if anybody at any time at any level feels entitled to the promo or the prize of any tournament, there is something wrong with the logic there. I agree. 100%. Uh, and the very last comment from Yarn says, can't wait for Ravensburger to reach out to Podcana to maybe host a live Podcana podcast on one of the events. I don't know if we'd ever, ever be able to. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Too many never, efforts. I really, <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate the support, but I don't know if they'd ever reach out to us to be like, come on, because... I don't know if we could all sit. Um, maybe me and Moyne could do it, but I know Brenda would be like, <laughs> no, like no, trying no. to trying to trying to contain himself. You know, They're like, what um, do you think about these new cards for this new set? And it's like, pay ten and gain one attack. And Moyne and Kyle were like, yeah, you know, you could play it. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to justify, it and Brendan's there, like, oh my god, I can't, I can't hold back. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we would I mean, say, we would say yes. Yeah, we of course we'd say yes. It, 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 yeah, uh, this is this is the this is the problem with us is like we we would love to work with Ravensburger, but I just don't know if they'd love to work with us. <laughs> is the thing. But, I think um, they would. They just don't know it yet. Yeah, yeah true, yeah. true, true. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll come back to this comment when it actually happens for sure. Maybe eventually. Maybe eventually. Yeah. <laughs> right, that was great. Those are some great questions. If you want to get yours yeah. right out in next week's pod, here's a comment on YouTube. We'll get it queued up. I'm excited for the next couple of weeks ramping up Larkana. We're about to all retire from our other games, whether it's SWU, it's One Piece, or Flesh and Blood, and we're entering the Larkana season. It's going to be exciting. I'm super excited for it. Like, if anybody listening to this, if you're new to card games, you haven't competed before, this is the time. 
This is the time to do it. This is the best time to compete. It's the most fun time to compete. The energy is going to be the best. The community is going to be the best. It's all downhill from here, baby. <laughs> like it's uh, <laughs> it's the most fun at the beginning. I highly recommend that you um, interact with it, compete in any way you can. It's just going to be a heck of a year. Yeah. Final thing I want to say is uh, please get Brendan a ticket to Atlanta, everyone. Yeah, please, PSA. PSA, you tell me what you need. I can get it done. You just tell me what you need. You say the word, I'll get it done. Um, and I'm super excited for some of the announcements that are going to be coming for Lakana on the grassroots side in 2024. Like I said, whatever y'all think, whatever you have in your mind is a possibility. It's 5 to 10x bigger. It's ridiculous. Um, so I'm excited. Anyway. If you listen to this podcast, you enjoy it. The number one thing you can do is leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps out so, 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 so much. Um, and also subscribe on YouTube. Hit that two subs- 2K subscribers. We really appreciate that. We've been hitting a lot of growth recently, and it encourages us to keep doing this, uh, keep investing in PodCana and the future. So thank you all so much. Video version of this on youtube.com slash at PodCana Podcast. Twitter's are Brendan APG, Moin underscore HS, Kawatech underscore CG. Don't forget to DM Moin for a Sakazuki list. No, stop <laughs> 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 Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.